Hi, I'm Meta Spencer, and I'm going to Montreal today and see an old friend. This, we're going to have a chat. Abraham Weisfeld and I um, are going to talk about Israel and Palestine, actually, because he lives about half of each year in Montreal. And uh, the other half, normally, he is in Palestine in a town called Nablus. Um, now, this is uh, always surprises people because um, Abraham Weisfeld, as the name might suggest, is Jewish. And uh, not very many Jewish uh, Canadian uh, activists uh, live half of their lives every year in Palestine. So people get a little bit surprised about that. But A.B. is a, uh, he was brought up to be non-Zionist. And uh, so he's got a, a real feeling for that part of the world. But this year he wasn't able to go because of the COVID situation. So he's housebound and I'm housebound and, and we're still having a good time. Good morning, A.B., how are you? Not too bad. Very well. To me. In your presence, I feel very well. <laughs> How sweet of you. All right. Let's get down to talking about Israel, because I hardly ever have a conversation with you about anything except Israel and Palestine. It's always the big issue in your life and, um, and what you normally do with your life. So you're not, you're not there this year, but today, as it happens, is the International Day for the Remembrance of the Holocaust or something with that similar title. Yes. And that is a very meaningful day to you, right? Yes. Uh, I was brought up very Jewish. I, uh, uh, both my parents are refugees from the uh, Holocaust. They didn't go through the worst of it, you know, in the uh, death camps or as slave labor you know, in the German munitions factories or anything like that, like my aunt was. But uh, they escaped uh, because they were, uh, I guess, uh, in the case of my mother, you know, politically conscious. She is a Jewish Bundist, uh, which was the Jewish movement, which was the um, most prominent uh, of the Jewish political parties uh, before the Holocaust, which was an anti-Zionist organization. And, well, uh, you're going to have to explain a lot about the Bundist because uh, even though I've, you've told me about it, um, it was sort of new to me when you first bro broached the subject. And I bet there are very few people nowadays who've even heard the term. Yes, that's because, you know, uh, most of the Jewish Bundists uh, were, um, you know, massacred by the uh, Nazis during the Holocaust. And uh, which was three million uh, in Poland, you know, uh, about 80 percent of whom were uh, voting for the Jewish Bundes party in the last municipal elections for the uh, Jewish uh, Municipal Council. Uh, and uh, this is a movement started in 1997, same year as the Zionist movement, which uh, <clears throat> sought to uh, achieve uh, Jewish security and, and what's called self-determination uh, in uh, the countries uh, which uh, the Jewish people considered to be their homeland. Like my, my, uh, my parents' families you know, considered Poland to be their homeland. And, uh, and so they, uh, my mother's uh, movement, you know, the Jewish Bund, uh, which means alliance, uh, mainly a working class organization, socialist, of course, sought to achieve a national cultural autonomy. That was the program of the Jewish Bund. And that was the way to solve the so-called Jewish question. As well, hold on, hold on. Uh, uh, let's, because that's already going to be a puzzle thing to other people, as indeed a little bit to me. National uh, autonomy, cultural autonomy. But, but, but cultural autonomy, but within whatever country they lived in, not Israel. I mean, That's there right. wasn't in Israel, but not in, in the Middle East at all, right? Yes. How could you have cultural autonomy in Poland, say? Well, it means that we have a right to uh, cultural institutions like synagogues, which were closed down in the USSR, actually, a uh, right to... Uh, um, have uh, uh, representation, self-representation within a, a Jewish government, an internal Jewish government for Jewish people, the right to, uh, you know, all the cultural attributes like kosher uh, food, which didn't exist in the USSR, which is one reason that my grandmother gave for not leaving uh, the Warsaw Ghetto to go to the USSR, 
and she ended up starving to death in the ghetto. So, you know, all of these things are very important, you know, to the Jewish people. Now, hold on, this is really the whole idea that you could have a government, a sort of a self-governing uh, political, ent political entity, though. These were people who wanted to have political independence within, within the state that is not Jewish. Yes, but it's not independence, it's autonomy. Autonomy okay. is, uh, is a constitutional formula found in the theory of uh, federalism. It's uh, something that has come up, you know, with respect to, let's say, the, the Kurdish nation within Syria, Turkey, uh, e uh, Iraq, and Iran. They're a, a people, a nationality within each of their homelands, but they are a nation, you know, in the international sense, international with a hyphen. And so they ask for autonomy within the constitutional apparatus of each of the countries in which they are living. And then they would have a federation amongst each of their various autonomies. The same thing with respect to the Jewish people. There are various uh, Jewish political tendencies which reflect this sentiment. For instance, we have the Jewish Bund, you know, which was calling for national cultural autonomy. Then there was the Jewish Autonomous Movement, which established the World Jewish Congress. Then there was the Territorialists, who wanted to set up a territory. And uh, their founder, Singville, called for a land without a people for a people without a land. And the slogan was uh, taken by the Zionists to refer to Palestine, even though there was another people living in the land. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's uh, been various programs that have been proposed, you know, to solve the, the uh, Jewish question, as Marx put yeah. it. <laughs> That's a loaded phrase, obviously. But let, let me ask, uh, the only thing that I've ever heard of that would sound sort of like what you're talking about, and maybe the question is, is it really like what you're talking about, was... The system that was in the Ottoman Empire, I believe, called the millet system, ah. and, and and they and they had, as I understand it, a lot of different ethnicities would live, even you know, cheek by jowl, sort of in the same towns and everything. They would all be there. They'd bump into each other in the street, but they had each each ethnic group, or I don't know whether you call them ethnic, but whatever they were, each population would have its own kind of government uh, and and I guess their own laws um, and um, so they would be a, a person would have to be accountable to one or another of these communities but they sort of it kind of I gather worked um, there's another similarity that I've heard of it in India where I don't know whether it's still true I think they've been talking about changing the family law but for a while anyway, and maybe still, um, if, if you were Muslim, uh, the, family, the family law that was for Muslims would apply to you. And if you were Hindu, it would you know, be a different set of laws that would apply to family, Hindu families, et cetera. Well, maybe, no. maybe other ethnic groups, I don't know. But that the laws would be uh, particular to each separate community, which means, of course, you have to decide what you are. And if you wanted to change or marry somebody in the other group or something, I guess it would be kind of confusing. But at any rate, theoretically, that could work, but it couldn't work for a lot of things like, you know, foreign policy or uh, how much to charge for the the sewers this year, you know, uh, each, you know, uh, making decisions for that were uh, for a whole uh, territory, uh, you know, who's going to pay to have the potholes fixed or yeah. something like well, that? I, you couldn't do that. Yes, no. Uh, Jewish Bundes autonomy refers to a, an internal uh, self-governing apparatus, yes. But it's not the same as the millet system in the Ottoman Empire because the millet system established a, a caste system of social orders for each uh, of two nationalities. Those two were the Jewish nationality and the uh, Christian nationality in Egypt called the Copts. Now, each of these two were uh, relegated to the millet system in which they had to pay us a special tax for the protection of the state, supposedly. And two, they were not allowed to become members of the military. 
this is called, it was called exemption from military service, but actually it was an exclusion from military service because each of these nationalities were not allowed to defend themselves. They were supposed to be defended by the state, by the caliphate, you know, but- okay, Now the state was presumably Muslim. Yes. And, and, and these millet, these exceptions were Christians and Jews. Yes. Were there any others? Were there Hindu millets? No. Or, no. Although there were other nationalities, you know, for instance, in uh, the Maghreb, in the Northern African <clears throat> countries, you know, with the uh, Islamic states, there were other nationalities, of course, who were indigenous to the region, Berbers, uh, Kabil, you know, who had their own languages, which were banned, but they weren't allowed any sense of autonomy. They were forcibly assimilated, which didn't work, and they still exist today, and it's still an outstanding issue in um, Algeria today, for example, and in Libya, and, uh, and uh, Tunisia, I don't know, but I presume could, that it would be the same case. But, you know, the milk system you know, was a degradation. It was a system of oppression. It wasn't a system of liberation for the nationalities. So... Well, okay, I, 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 I'll take your word for it, except I won't completely, because I, what I read about it described it as kind of a, a workable system in which at least these people had quite a bit of autonomy with it, you know, self-governance, each, each population. Um, and I don't know how how much abused they were, but um, but I I you know the only things I read about it make it sound almost attractive. I mean, compared to Europe, yes, it was. You know, uh, there were no <clears throat> systematic massacres of the Jewish people. The synagogues were allowed to flourish uh, in Jerba, an island off of uh, Tunisia. Um, there was a uh, a Jewish community, which was rather autonomous and co contiguous. <clears throat> uh, but, you know, there were massacres that took place uh, nonetheless, you know, at certain times when uh, the Jewish people were associated with uh, any uh, colonial enterprise that had taken over and occupied the country. And uh, like France uh, provided for French citizenship to the, uh, to the Jewish Algerians and used them in the uh, administration, administrative apparatus, you know, of the colonial state. And so there was a certain resentment, you know, that was focused in on the uh, Jewish Algerians, which was um, unfortunate. Uh, and, uh, you know, so many of the Jewish people left Algeria to go and live in France as a result, together with the fascists who left at the same time. So it wasn't, you know, entirely successful, although it was stable for, for a pretty long period of time. So the Jewish Bund, you know, was proposing national cultural autonomy with self-regulation in the countries of residence, which the Jewish people considered to be their homeland. And they didn't seek to, you know, like leave their homelands and give up the fight against fascism and chauvinism. So the Jewish Bund was a Jewish liberation movement that sought to do away with fascism by bringing in socialism and by bringing in the autonomy of the Jewish people. Now, I was educated in this manner by my mother. I was raised Orthodox. I was raised very Jewish, you know, in the traditional sense. My father was Orthodox socialist, but not a Bundist because he came from a less cosmopolitan city in the south of France, in the south of uh, Poland. In fact, he came from a little uh, town outside of Lublin called Bian Bianca. And his father was a chassid, you know, with the pious and the black clothes and everything like that. So, you know, like my Jewish upbringing teaches me not to be a, a Zionist, whereas, you know, most Jewish people were raised to be Zionists, you know, because the Jewish educational system in, in, in Israel educated the Jewish people only in Zionist history and not in Jewish history. But hold on, your father wasn't a Zionist either, even though he wasn't a Bundist. So right. there were non-Zionists, non-Bundists too. Yes. Okay, what was that all about? Were, were there whole traditions or, or were there sects of uh, Judaism or what? What no. kind of people were non-Buddhist, non-Buddhist, non Bundist, non-Zionists? Yes. All of the Judaic uh, Jewish people, that is the Orthodox Jewish people, were non-Zionists. All oh. of them. Oh. Because Zionism began as an anti-religious movement because they considered that, that Judaism was, was self-defeating because it was asking Jewish people to wait for the Messiah and uh, was not... Uh, you know, uh, Orthodox Judaism 
didn't have a program to deal with, you know, anti-Semitism and fascism. And then okay, the so, uh, hold on. So now that explains something to me, I think, if I'm because I've been puzzled by the fact that a lot of the very Orthodox Jews in Israel are sort of non-Israeli or something. A and maybe that is because of their non-Zionist tradition. That's right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, because they're traditional rabbis to which they um, continue to uh, follow uh, uh, a respectful tradition of uh, following their teachings by means of their writings are non-Zionist. Even those who've, who participate in the Netanyahu government. <laughs> <laughs> the Shasta, Shasta uh, party, which is a uh, religious, orthodox, conservative, and part of the government of Netanyahu is non-Zionist nonetheless. Mm -hmm. And their members, you know, live in Jerusalem only, not in Tel Aviv. And uh, they don't, uh, and they refused uh, to allow their children to be conscripted into the army. That's why there's been a number of confrontations over the past year when the uh, Netanyahu government tried to bring in a conscription law because uh, uh, a lot of, you know, uh, secular Israelis, you know, resent the exemption from military service <clears throat> by the Hasids, you know, the Orthodox, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, their children don't have to lose three years or two years of their life, you know, to the military conscription. And so they wanted to impose conscription on the Orthodox because they were Zionists yeah. and the Orthodox were not. So, you know, well, how's that going? And by the way, first, uh, the question that occurs to me, if if these super Orthodox people are sort of non-Israeli, does that make them any friendlier to the Palestinians? Not necessarily. No, no, because it's okay. it's it's sort of a particularist, you know, like self-serving, you know, uh, ideology that they've turned uh, Judaism into in order to. Uh, uh, promote Judaism of, you know, outside of Zionism. And so they only use, they, they consider Zionism to be a horse, to be a donkey on which they are riding to their own, you know, pre preconceived goals. Okay. Mm -hmm. Plus the state, you know, provides them with subsidies to maintain their, you know, social security. So they, 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 they cooperate with the Zionist state to that, to that extent. But they do not consider Israel to be Jewish. Neither do I, from a Jewish per perspective, even though Israel calls itself <laughs> Jewish. This is really cute. I love the idea. <laughs> Israel is not Jewish. That sounds like a good placard to carry around the street to see. <laughs> That's precisely what the Natura Carta sect does. What? Yes, the Natura Carta um, are a group of Orthodox Jews who live in Jerusalem and elsewhere who carry signs at Palestinian demonstrations saying that Israel is not Jewish and that they uh, call for the dismantlement of the Zionist state. Okay. All right. So it, it, it all sort of fits together if you know all the pieces, you know, uh -huh. but, you know, most Jewish people are not educated, you know, to these other sort of uh, facets of, uh, of the Jewish political culture because they're only taught, you know, a Zionist uh, political history and is a copy of the Israel uh, educational system. And that's in the, even in the Jewish school system in North America. Except okay, but for now, before Israel was formed, oh, I, I don't know, when, how, what would be, have been the distribution of these groups within Judaism as a whole? Would, it was, I, I, I've always assumed that Zionists quickly became the predominant movement because they won. They got Israel, right? Um, so they must have been numerically stronger than either the Bundist group or these Orthodox Israel is not Jewish groups. Not necessarily. No? Before the Holocaust, the Zionists had 8% support amongst the Jewish communities. <clears throat> 8%. All right. But when did Zionism begin anyway? I, I, I know the answer, but I can't remember it. Okay. Well, all the Jewish Bundist members, you know, in Europe were killed off. So after the Holocaust, they weren't around. And the Zionists, you know, had a proportionally, you know, heavier representation in Jewish people. Why would the Bundists have been killed more than other people? Because uh, the Bundist, uh, uh, Bundist membership was in Europe, Eastern Europe, and that's where the Jewish people were killed. So 
the, the, you know, the Bundes weren't around afterwards. Secondly, the Zionists <coughs> had support from various uh, state actors, you know, in Britain, uh, even though they at one point um, had a white paper that uh, was favoring the Palestinians. Nonetheless, the British military occupation in Palestine favored the Zionist militia and provided them with arms and uh, with uh, training. The, uh, the Soviet Union also provided the Zionists with arms from Czechoslovakia and voted in favor of the recognition of the uh, Zionist state, even their vote would have made all the difference. Without that vote, Israel would not have been recognized by the United Nations General Assembly. Is there a particular ideological reason why all these states lined up in favor of Zionism rather than hmm. Buddhism, if there is such a word as Buddhism? Uh, because it would seem logical to me that they would have preferred the outfit that claimed we should stay here and be Polish or American or Russian or whatever. Well, um, of the uh, Jewish survivors, together with the refugees that came uh, out of the Soviet Union, like my parents, it comprised about uh, 500,000. So the, um, all of the states in the world were not interested in receiving Jewish refugees. The United States, because the Jewish refugees were socialists, and uh, Canada and Australia, all the British Commonwealth, you know, refused Jewish refugees unless they were sponsored by a member of their family who were already a citizen of that country. And so they couldn't turn them down. Like my father's sister sponsored us to come to Canada. And that comprised 52% of the Jewish refugees. 48% of the Jewish refugees couldn't get a visa to go to any other country. Two. There was no proposition to set up a Jewish autonomous territory in Germany at the time around the refugee camps, which is theoretically possible, but it wasn't you know, proposed by anybody, not even the Jewish refugees. It was inconceivable because it was considered to be you know, a, 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 a non-sequitur a, a non you know, because you know, they knew that no country in Europe would accept the Jewish territory, so they didn't even propose it. So these 48% of the Jewish refugees couldn't get a visa to go anywhere else. And so where were they going to go? So the Zionists came in and said, you know, come with us and we'll give you a, a home to live in. Yeah, a home that used to belong to a Palestinian. And so the 48% who are not Zionists ended up going to Palestine anyways, because they had nowhere else to go. And then their children were indoctrinated to become Zionists thereafter, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. That helps. Uh, yeah, I kind of, I feel better already now that I know all this. Tell me now about what the hell's going on over there now. If we can move to talking about the current drama in, in, in Israel, because as of right now, I think yesterday Netanyahu was, was asked again to form a government and he'd been trying a time after time and Screw it up. <laughs> What's the story over there? Okay, so the president, Rivlin, who's a member of the Likud party of Netanyahu, has asked Netanyahu to form a government, but he most likely will not be able to do so. He only has like 54 seats and a majority of 61 seats to form a government in a coalition. Now, what's more interesting in this election than any other election is that the results have produced two Palestinian parties that have significant number of seats that are needed to form a coalition with in order to form a majority. So the Palestinian parties have never previously been allowed to participate in a coalition government. But now they hold in their hands the majority. Now, the left-wing coalition of Palestinian parties, the joint list, have about seven seats. And the, and the conservative, you know, Palestinian party, which is Islamic, has five seats. So the two sides, you know, of the right and left in the, amongst the Israeli parties are trying to maneuver to get the support of the Ram Islamic Palestinian party, but without providing them with a seat in the cabinet, which would be, you know, catastrophic. 
for this Zionist mentality in Israel. So they're trying to. Yeah, keep- I'm sorry. It would be catastrophic if they got a uh, if they if a Palestinian had a, a, a seat in in the cabinet. Yes, because then their coalition would be considered non-legitimate by a significant proportion of the population, and they wouldn't <laughs> consider, and they wouldn't follow the government anymore. You know, they would they would you know like they would rebel. You know, they would try you know to stop to you know a coup d'état or something. So this you know? is really you have to be Jewish to be a legitimate member of the government. Yes, because they've been indoctrinated to believe that Israel is a Jewish state. So therefore, you can only have Jewish parties in the government, logically, as a result of the nation state law. So what to do with 20% of the population who are, pop, who are Palestinian, who voted for Palestinian parties, and who now have you know, 11 seats in the, uh, in the parliament, in the Knesset. You know? So they're in a quandary. And now they've had the fourth election because of this phenomenon. Oh, so this has been going on a while. This is the fourth election in the last two years. But, but I know, but I didn't know that that was part of it, that the, the, yes, the yes, position of the Palestinians was a significant reason why they keep, keep getting, and they have more and more elections. They can't of, solve it. Of course not. The Zionists will not admit this. You know, it's a neurotic political mentality in which they cannot, you know, recognize the actuality of, of what, you know, Israel is. Israel is a multi, you know, a binational, you know, entity. You know, 20% of the population is significant. You know, mm-hmm. here in, in Canada, you know, the Jewish population is 5% of the population. No, sorry, 3% of the population. United States, 1.5% of the population. In Israel, the Palestinians are 20% of the population, and they vote. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So... Why, you, you are smiling, and I am smiling. I mean, it's simple. It's kind of significant, isn't it, that that both of us find this entertaining and enjoyable. That <laughs> I guess it's because I mean I have I've come to think that almost everything that Israel does as a state is wrongheaded. So let's see if you know. I don't know what the Palestinians would do if they were actually running the government, but it sounds like a fun idea. <laughs> oh, Ram. You know, the, the leader of Ram, whose name is Abbas, the same as the prime minister of, uh, yeah. of the Palestinian Authority, he went on, uh, on uh, Israel television. All three major television networks uh, had him present his speech, you know, because he was the key to whether or not there was going to be a coalition government formed with his tacit support. And, you know, the major media were willing to sort of, you know, legitimize, legitimize this concept because he was from a conservative Palestinian political party. And so, you know, they could conceive of, you know, this conservative Palestinian political party being in a government uh, and being in tacit support of a conservative government, you know, of Israel. So it seemed, you know, to but fit. But they could is a conservative government, right? Yes. yes. So that, why isn't that a successful idea then? Because the supporters of the conservative Likud party would not accept the Palestinian party that would give tacit support to form a majority because of course they would extract concessions for social security for the Palestinian citizens for police protection as in the north the northeast of Israel the Palestinian villages were left uh, to remain there because they were more Christian than they were Muslim and uh, the initial founders of Israel didn't want to antagonize the Christian countries that were supporting them by expelling the Christians because they wouldn't be able to explain that, you know, to their Christian populations. Now, so what's going to happen? Well, you know, if nothing happens, then there will be a fifth election, in which case, you know, the same scenario will probably be repeating itself. But by that time, perhaps Netanyahu will have been, uh, he's, you know, he's on trial for corruption. I know. It's like, <laughs> so, <laughs> so at one point, Trump, they couldn't put Trump on trial while he was president. But it sounds like it's a different rule in Israel. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. Israeli people, you know, Jewish people love, you know, courts and stuff like that. And the law. The law <laughs> is more important than the state. The law is actually the essence of Judaism. Judaism is basically a system of laws. You know, besides being a religious belief, you know, in a deity. Okay. It is a system of laws. That's the more important thing. 
the Mosaic law, you know, which starts with the Ten Commandments, which are interpreted, interpreted, and, and elaborated, you know, like with the Talmud, etc., and the Mishnah and the Gemara. So there are books and books and books, you know, of this law, mm-hmm. which is one of the, you know, uh, 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 cornerstones of a Western, you know, uh, law as well. This is where it comes from. And this Judaic law comes from the Hammurabi code and from the Egyptian law of the pharaohs. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. You mean the Ten Commandments, God didn't really write those on stone? Yeah, they, got, they got them from Hammurabi? <laughs> well, well you know, he couldn't have, you know, uh, because Moses broke the first set of tablets when he got pissed off with the Israelites, you know, with the, uh, with the, they weren't Israelites. They were the Jewish people who were, who, you know, had built the, uh, the golden calf. Yeah. And they were turning uh, into uh, worshipers of Baal, you know, this pagan yeah. God. Okay. So, that Moses broke the 10 commandments. That's, that's right. right. And then he went back up the mountain. He made another set and he came down with the second set. Okay. <laughs> second of all, you know, Moses wrote the first five books, you know, so. And, uh, and, and the proof that uh, it was written by a human is that in the Genesis, when it talks about the creation of the universe, you know, uh, and it says that on the first day, you know, uh, the deity created, you know, light, which is the sun. The second day created the earth. But how could the first day have been the first day if the earth had not existed yet? Because the day is considered to be the uh, rotation of the earth, right? Oh. So the terms used are terms which are human terms. Theology is human. Well, I don't have any problem with that, but that's fine. But sure. Okay. okay. So now let's get back to Israel, as it's called. Okay. Israel is the name of the Jewish people, actually. Okay. It's not the name of a territory. And the Zionists used the term Eretz Yisrael. But Eretz Yisrael was never a Jewish nation state, even under David and Solomon. It was a multinational country because uh, even, you know, the, you, know, you know, Solomon had, you know, like what, 300 wives. They weren't all Jewish. Okay. So the descendants, you know, of these initial founders of the Israelite kingdom produced, you know, a progeny which were not necessarily Jewish. In fact, the mother of David was a Moabite. Okay. Okay. Now, you see, the picture becomes, you know, different, you know, when you look into the, you know, like uh, precision of the matter. Even Joshua, who is presented, you know, by the uh, Ezra version of the, of the Bible, Torah, he is, you know, you know, presented, you know, in the Torah, in its history, as having made a peace treaty with the Hittite nation, which was a nation living within the land of Canaan, which became Palestine, which became Israel. So there was an original peace treaty that was followed by the Israelites who lived in a coexistence with the other nations of whom there were seven within the same territory that originally was Canaan. And the language that was used was not Hebrew. The common language was Aramaic. Oh, all right. So, you know, what we have now as Israel is not a copy of what was Israel before. Well, I, I didn't know Aramaic is... is what's the connection between hebrew and aramaic is are they sort of the same family of languages or what's uh semite languages I yes. mean, we always hear of, of aramaic as what jesus spoke that's right uh so jesus wasn't jewish <laughs> yes he was jewish and all the jewish people all the israelites at that time spoke aramaic hebrew was used for prayers like latin is used oh, in really? the catholic church oh, really yes and hebrew doesn't come even from canaan Hebrew comes from Iraq, Mesopotamia, the region of Sumar, and the city of Ur, where Abraham originated. Abraham himself was not Jewish, of course, because the Jewish people didn't exist. Even though the Zionists referred to Abraham and the covenant with Abraham as the uh, contract you know, for the uh, ownership of the land of Israel, which doesn't exist as a contract. Now, okay. <laughs> even in the Torah, it says that the covenant with Abraham for residents in the land of Canaan was a welcoming mat. It wasn't a contract, you know, giving possession, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a property sense, you know, of the land. It was a welcoming, you know, 
like uh, salam in Arabic means you are welcome, you know, with peace. This is based upon the Abrahamic covenant. And it still exists in Islamic and Arabic, you know, uh, folklore. Okay, what does this covenant say? That all the descendants of Abraham are welcome in the land of Canaan forever. What is, who is the first son of Abraham? Of course, you know, like at that time, you know, inheritance rights <clears throat> were granted to the firstborn son, not the daughter and not the secondborn son, but the firstborn son only, who became the new patriarch. Okay. The firstborn son of Abraham was Ishmael, the father of the Arab people. Oh, ah. uh -huh. oh. Ah. Uh, well, I mean, and that is a current myth that Ishmael was his, he and his mother were sent out to wander and they became the, he became the head of, of, of the Arab nation. Now, but that is just something like, a, I mean, an urban myth. Wait, wait, wait. I mean, is this current? There's something it, missing there. There's something missing there. Because uh, Ishmael and his mother Hajar, who was an Egyptian, yeah. were sent out. But by whom? Not by Abraham. By his wife. Ah, because of the matriarchal privilege. Uh. You see? Because there was a matri there's a matriarchy as well, which has control over the internal workings of the family. So, and Hajar was originally her uh, servant. Right. So she so sent them away because- no, Sarah? Yes, that's right. Sarah said, get out of here. Yes. And he had to go along with it. He had to, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, following uh, uh, fact, which exists as well in Torah, which is indicative, is but, that- I'm sorry, but I'm not gonna let you out of this. <laughs> What makes you claim that, that, I mean, I know that I've heard people say this, but what kind of biblical evidence would there be for the claim that Ishmael was the, the head of the Arab people, the, oh. founder, the father of the Arab nation? Uh, because it says in the Torah that Ishmael became the uh, founder of a host of nations. And he, says that, and that's pretty, that's pretty good. You know, you got to accept that, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Then what followed <clears throat> when Sarah died, Abraham, he uh, bought a piece, uh, a tract of land to bury her with a cave, this cave called the Melpalak cave and the surrounding lands he bought for 400 pieces of silver. Now, if the land was given to Abraham as a possession, in a private sense, then why would he have had to have paid for the land in the first place? So this is proof that the land was not given as a possession in a private sense to Abraham, but that the covenant with Abraham was a covenant for uh, a welcome for the Abrahamic clan to reside in that land. So this is further proof that there is no such thing as an Eretz Yisrael, which belongs to the Jewish people alone. Okay, so all of your, what you're giving now is the Bundes line, right? You're no. explaining, no? No. That's, Judaic. Other, That's huh? a Judaic position. I'm talking to you from my Orthodox <laughs> education. Oh. I went through seven years of primary school in a Jewish cheder, in oh. Jewish Talmud Torah, okay. together in the evenings while I was going to the Protestant school during the day. All right. I went to two schools at the same time. Well, it shows. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, sounds good. All right. So, I don't know where we are. Uh, what's this? No, where, what's where happening in Palestine? Pardon? What's happening in Palestine is more interesting. Oh, yeah, but, but uh, okay. So, we've, we've covered Israel. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to I cover a little bit more about Netanyahu. What, well, suppose he gets convicted while he's a president of the country, or the, what is he, prime minister? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, he, he gets convicted. <laughs> so what happens? He serves his, he serves his country. He moves, the, he moves his office to the jail and, and keeps on uh, running the country from. <laughs> no, it's not so easy. No, it, that, it's not so easy to, to consider that uh, matter resolved in that manner. No, 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 no. Because he can delay his court proceedings for another five years. 
Okay. That's why he wants to be reelected, for one thing, I guess. Yes. Uh, so, but he's being charged. He can't get out of that, right? That's right. You know, Mindel, has, okay. yeah, the, the attorney general who charged him, Mindelbach, is also a member of his political party. <laughs> really? Okay. And, you know, but, you know, law is the law. And it's, it's, it's stronger than the Zionist ideology. It's stronger than the Zionist state. The law is the law in, okay. in Judaism and in the Jewish political culture. And even a prime minister cannot escape the consequences thereof. Okay. Okay. Now, there is only one thing that can change the deadlock in uh, Israeli politics. And that is if Netanyahu resigns as the head of the Likud party, they choose a new leader, then they have a new coalition, and then Bennett and the others, you know, you know fragments of the right wing uh, would uh, join in with Likud because, you know, um, uh, many of them oppose a coalition, you know, with the Likud party, be precisely because Netanyahu is the head of the coalition. That's so Netanyahu, I mean, That's a good reason, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and there's been demonstrations against Netanyahu every week, you know, for a year now mm -hmm. in his neighborhood. And the last one before the election was, you know, 50,000 people strong. But the media doesn't cover this. The media doesn't cover the orthodox demonstrations against conscription either. And they're doing civil disobedience, being hosed down, uh, beaten with uh, police sticks and, uh, and arrested and imprisoned. Why and does the media cover it? Because I thought Israel supposedly is a democracy, you'd think one criterion of being a democracy is that you can get straight answers out of the press. Yes, well, yes, 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 but, 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 you know, yeah, all the newspapers, you know, are private corporations, and they will only cater, you know, to their readership in order to sell their newspapers, and their readership would not accept, you know, uh, the reports uh, uh, such as that which I have given you. I've written reports, you know, from inside Palestine, you know, from a Jewish perspective, you know, uh, which would be most interesting for the readership of Israel. But even how Eretz, liberal Zionist, you know, newspaper that publishes anti-Zionist, you know, articles from Amir Ahas and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Gideon Levy, they wouldn't accept my articles, even with my qualifications as a doctor of political science. There are limitations, you know, to democracy, even though it's democratic. Okay, now go on and tell us about Palestine, because we haven't okay. even got to Palestine. Now, the Palestinian people are really pissed off with the Prime Minister Abbas, because, you know, he sort of caters, you know, to Israel's whims. He arrests Palestinians. There's a special police called the Preventive Security Police, which have brown jeeps, as opposed to the black jeeps of the, Israel, of the Palestinian police, the normal police, civil police. There's a special police force that is financed by, uh, by the Palestinian Authority to arrest Palestinians who might be a threat to the security of the state of Israel, whether it be against civilians or not. And they could be, you know, political organizers. They could be, you know, uh, eloquent speakers, whatever Israel considers to be a threat to their security and to the continued military occupation of the West Bank is reported to the Palestinian Authority. They send it to the French security police and they go and arrest the Palestinian and put them in a Palestinian prison. Okay. And all the Palestinians know this. And they don't like Abbas for this reason. I could see why they might not. Secondly, they got, they got disenchanted with even Yasser Arafat because he signed the Oslo Agreement in, in which he recognized the existence of the State of Israel, even though the State of Israel did not recognize the existence of the Palestine state. So he gave Israel a big favor and expected, you know, Israel to be generous and recognize the Palestine state, you know, in the five years, you know, limit that was assigned to, for Israel to do so. But Israel never did. So Arafat, you know, became, uh, people became disenchanted with Arafat as well, and with his party Fatah, which is the party of Abbas. So in the upcoming Palestinian elections, the 22nd of, of May, 
it is, seems likely that the uh, Fatah party is going to lose. There's 30 different lists of political formations that are registered now to be candidates in the Palestinian election. 30. Wait a minute, though. Uh, I mean, this is not new, but uh, uh, um, he's, he's been dead 10 years or 15. So why would they be more disenchanted with Fatah now than they were when he was actually uh, making, well, whenever the Oslo Accord occurred? Well, if, if that's what bothers them. Hmm. Uh, well, they're not more disenchanted. In fact, they're somewhat less disenchanted because the Fatah Party, which controls international diplomacy and all the Palestine embassies throughout the world, recognized or not, has actually succeeded in its diplomatic initiatives in the United Nations and in the International Criminal Court to secure the recognition of the Palestine state now by the recent decision of the International Criminal Court in The Hague, which is independent of the United Nations plus all the various you know, votes in the UN General Assembly and the great majority which uh, you know, favored Palestine. So all these things you know, tend to sort of give credence you know, to Fatah, but that's only on the external you know, uh, factor. Internally, they're not you know, like, uh, accepted as the government of Palestine. Even Hamas yeah, accepts- what, what, is, what is Abbas's uh, party? Fatah. So that is, so they, they, he in effect is, okay, go on. Okay. Now, uh, externally, you know, like Fatah and Hamas are united, you know, Hamas supports Fatah in the international diplomacy. And Hamas has even come out, you know, with a declaration saying that it's willing to recognize the state of Israel if Israel recognizes the state of Palestine. So they're willing to go through with an extrapolation of the Oslo Accords. Mm -hmm. And even changed, they dumped the old charter of 1988. And they have a new charter which removes all the anti Semitic, you know, uh, nonsense. And they have come out with a charter now which declares their political program to be in opposition to the ideology of Zionism and, and the Zionist state, but not against the Jewish people. Jewish people are not mentioned now. So they've what removed. What are they asking for if not, if, I mean, Zionism means a Jewish state? So are they asking for some sort of one state solution or what? No, they're asking for two state interim solution with the recognition of the Palestine state, the withdrawal of the Israel military, the negotiations of what to do with the settlers and the, and the Palestinian refugees for reasonable accommodation. This is their program now. It's also the program for Fatah. So they have the same program basically. Now, it's okay to me. Yeah. Now, <laughs> but I don't think it would sell in Israel, right? You think no. it would sell? No. No, but the Israelis don't have a vote in the Palestinian elections. <laughs> right. Yeah, I know. But, but I mean, the point is, if that is what they're demanding, they're not going to get it. Well, it's not a matter of what uh, Israel or the Israelis are willing to accept. It's a matter of what they're obliged to accept. Because once they get condemned for human rights violations in the International Criminal Court, that goes to the United Nations Security Council for implementation. And the question of sanctions comes up. And also uh, UN peacekeeping troops could be sent in. And this is all dependent upon Security Council. And if the International Criminal Court you know, condemns Israel, then how can the United States you know, veto such a resolution? It would be in great embarrassment to do so. Oh, come on. Wow, you're really going off into a never, never land. I mean, you're thinking about a, a scenario that has never even, I've never even heard of before. Even the Biden administration currently has uh, set up uh, political relations with the Palestinian Authority, with Abbas. They have uh, donated $15 a billion dollars, you know, to Palestine, you know, for, like they do, you know, like for Israel, they, they, they commit billions of dollars. Now they're doing the same for Palestine. And uh, they are uh, indicating that they will have a more positive attitude to resolutions, you know, favoring Palestine in the United Nations. This is the Biden administration. Well, I mean, you know, this is all totally new to me. And as I well, I've never heard any of this. They're considering, you know, renewing the financing of the United Nations 
a refugee re relief uh, uh, program for the Palestinians as well. Okay, so what are people in Israel doing? Are they jumping up and down and screaming or what? I, I, why haven't I heard about this? Because this is, I, I'm, I'm sorry to, I, I'm almost embarrassed to, the, to be so clearly pro-Palestinian. I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> I, I should sound neutral, but I really think, how neat, what a great idea. But so that's not very nice of me, but there you go. <laughs> That's yeah, a way yeah, but these things are not, you know, publicized uh, to any great extent, you know, by the media. Not because the media is controlled by Jewish pro-Zionists, because the media is, is, well, the media in North America, okay, more so in the United States than in Canada, but there is a significant representation of, of a Jewish influence in, in, the, uh, in the media, yes, because Jewish people write a lot. This is, you know, a part of the tradition, you know, the writing tradition. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a, you know, half or majority of the media is controlled by Christian owners. And they are pro-Zionist as well, because it fits in, you know, with certain of the Christian doctrine, which calls for restoration, restorationism, or depensionalizationalism, I think it's called, in the Protestant, you know, Christian uh, theology. Well, I've heard that it's true of various fundamentalist sects. That's right. I, I think it, it's not going too far to say. I mean, I'm I sort of belong to an Anglican church. I'm not very good at it, but um, you know, I don't hear that kind of talk there at all. You no, know, Anglicanism is just somewhat, uh, somewhat a, of a of a of an entity on its own. Yes, but. You know, the idea is, you know, like in the, the Anglican Church itself is the, uh, is the state church of England, of Great Britain, of the United Kingdom. And the queen is the head of the Anglican Church, and she's the head of state as well. So Anglicanism is the state religion in England, as, you know, Lutheranism, you know, tends to be in Germany, Calvinism in, in Holland, and, uh, you know, Christianity in general, you know, in the United States of America. That's why it says, in God we trust, you know, on the American dollar bill, even though that was only added in 1937. Yeah, yeah, I was just taking Anglicanism as a, as a kind of typical of most mainline Christianity. It's the, it's the evangelicals and, and uh, fundamentalists that I think are, I've heard, tend to be pro-Zionist. Yes. Uh, because they believe in some kind of, you know, there's a something well, coming that's supposed to be the when all the dead get a, raised or something. Yes. Well, some of the evangelical sects, you know, consider it's necessary to send all the Jewish Americans and Jewish Canadians, you know, to Israel. But that's a minority opinion. Generally, you know, there's a sentiment, you know, amongst the Protestant uh, uh, theological uh groupings, that uh, Israel is a Jewish country and their country is a Christian country, even though there's Jewish people, you know, who live there and now Muslims who live within the country, but that they are expected to, to acknowledge, you know, that they're living in a Christian country. So, you know, there's sort of a mixed bag of things happening there. <clears throat> but, okay, getting back to Palestine. Palestine has a similar conception of itself in that it considers that it should be a Muslim country. And, uh, you know, a Muslim nation state. But they're now confronted, you know, with the Israeli Zionist settlers who are there for both ideological and economic reasons and theological reasons. So it gets complicated. So they're going to have to contend with that. But the Palestinian people uh, disenchantment with the Fatah party means that in the West Bank, there's a certain, you know, favorable attitude towards Hamas which is considered to be more militant, has stood up to the Zionist state and has had some success in doing so. But in the Gaza Strip, the Palestinians are disenchanted with the Hamas government because their uh, steadfastness and, and uh, retaliation against attacks by Israel have resulted in further attacks by Israel. So they're less likely to vote for Hamas, more likely to vote for Fatah. So who knows what's gonna happen really but, you know, there's also an independence list. 
And then there's a new list set, being set up, you know, by the uh, political prisoner, um, uh, Burgatti, Bur Marwan Burgatti, who has allied himself with a nephew of, of uh, Arafat to set up a new political formation that is running against Fatah. And they may actually win the election because Marwan Burgatti is favored to be mm -hmm. uh, the... the so what uh, would happen? Well, okay. The, the, what happened the first time in 2006, when there was the first election, this was the first democratic election in an Arab country, the Palestine election of 2006. And there, both sides, uh, they refused to accept the results of the election because Hamas won. Israel refused to accept those uh, election results. Fatah refused to accept the election result. And so uh, Palestine split. Hamas kept Gaza and Fatah kept the West Bank. And so there was no unified government. There were two governments of Palestine, Palestinian Authority and the independent Palestinian yeah. government. Would that, would, if, if they all lined up on the same party this time, mm -hmm. uh, I, I gather that's a possibility, uh, then would they get back together again? Would, uh, you know, Gaza and the West Bank, would they re, re Yes. Yeah, they would. Yeah. And then, okay. and then they would negotiate with Israel to follow through on the Oslo Accords to allow some sort of a transportation system between Gaza and the West Bank. Well, you know, this sounds kind of pleasant. I mean, uh, it sounds like maybe there's something to look forward to here. Except <laughs> that the Likud government of Netanyahu has refused to negotiate with the Palestine government to further the uh, Oslo Accords because they are now insisting on an extra condition, which was not part of the Oslo Accords. They're insisting that the Palestine government recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Okay. Which it was never part of the previous you know, constitutional apparatus, which was not part of the Oslo Agreement. Yeah. And if it did recognize that, then it could actually empower the Israel government with a majority to expel the Palestinian population or to cede those territories and, and say that they're now part of Palestine and that the Palestinians living there no longer have a vote. So that's still, ju that's still just Netanyahu, right? Yeah. If Netanyahu's out, will that doctrine or that demand also go with him? Or will the next guy also say, you've got to deal with us, you've got to recognize Israel as a, as a Jewish state? Hmm. No, that's Netanyahu. That's just Netanyahu. Well, good. That's another reason to give him the boot. Yeah. Okay. That sounds um, very encouraging. Although I, I never heard anybody else say there's anything encouraging going on in that wretched place. But anyway, oh, what's encouraging is that there's an election taking place finally. Oh, okay. You know, even though you know Abbas, uh, his mandate to be prime minister expired long, long ago. Okay. Right. You know, uh, but an election is happening. Presidential election is going to be happening. So there's going to be a big change happening. The Palestinians are getting it together. And the Israelis yeah, are falling apart. Right. Okay, we used up our time, and this has been fun. Yeah, I appreciate this. So yes. I, I, I am much smarter than I was half an hour ago. Yeah, appreciate that. Okay, take care. And I'll, uh, I hope you get to go back to where you want to be. Bless your heart. Thank you so much. It's been, been, been real fun. Take care. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.